All right, Mario, welcome to the podcast. Really appreciate you coming hey. on. Awesome. I'm so excited to be here. What a blessing. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, it's beautiful how we got connected through Pastor Corey, which I got connected through him via Twitter. So just like a beautiful serendipitous moment to bring us together and really excited to talk about your your background, which is very interesting, but also your book, which you're coming out with soon, which is something that I feel like I'm going to relate to a lot and also just a very interesting topic. But I do want to start with, did I see that you proposed to your wife after two weeks of knowing her? <laughs> Who told you that? <laughs> yes, that is correct. Oh, man. That's a great first question. Um, and the, the ironic part is that I was a total bachelor. I did not want to get married. I used to tell people I was not going to get married. Maybe I'll have kids someday, but, but no marriage. And there was a friend of mine that was writing a book at the time. This is 2005. And the book was about all the guys that she had met according to her classification. And I was the fear of commitment guy. So that's how people know me, just to give you an idea. And then I went to Brazil for a business trip. And uh, before I went to Brazil, though, I had been at this job for two months. And I hadn't met the CEO. The CEO was traveling. He came like two days before I left. And I went to introduce myself. And I told him, hey, nice to meet you. My name is Mario. And I won't see you for a few months because they sent me on this big, long um, job back in Brazil. But don't worry about it because I don't have dogs, plants. I'm not married. I don't have kids. And he smiled and he laughed at me. He told me, don't worry about it. You're going to come back married. Sure enough, when I came back, I was engaged and seven months later, I was married. So yes, happily married. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. What was, her initial, what was her initial reaction after when you first said it? <laughs> he, was, he was just laughing. He said, I told you, I know the power of Brazil. Did you go to Brazil on your trips or not? I did not make it to Brazil, no. Well, you got to go, but I, you know, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I'm ready to get married, I'll, I'll pop down. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. And what company were you working for at the time or what were you doing? Yeah. So look, my, my journey has been interesting. I would say that I'm a self-proclaimed nerd. I went to really good schools in the U.S. I came here to go to college and I went initially to Michigan, Michigan State. My uncle was going, I was a professor there and I guess runs the family. And then with a degree in accounting, and then I got on a, a scholarship to get a master's degree at University of Illinois in accounting as well, which at that time was the number one accounting school in the world. So that, that tells you how much of a nerd I am. I got my certified public accounting degree and all that good stuff. So very traditional kind of educational background. Then I, I got a couple other graduate degrees, but once I got that, those degrees, I started working in public accounting, which is as an auditor, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, they're the auditors that audit most of the Fortune 500 companies. And then after a while, I started working at an advertising agency, which was more, more suited to me because I'm a people person. I'm, a, I'm an extrovert. I'm a big vision, a big ideas type of guy. And being an accountant by itself didn't suit me very well. So I figured if I'm going to be an accountant, I might as well do it at a, an exciting industry. And boy, that was exciting. So I worked at an advertising agency. Is the holding company is called Interpublic Group of Companies. I ended up working there for 14 years. And that's where I did most of my uh, my professional development was there. I, I was going up in the career ladder like a rocket. Like I, I just kept going and going and going, getting promotions, getting bonuses, getting this, getting that. And that led me to Brazil. There was a need in Brazil in 2015 for a CFO. And I was a controller back then for those who speak the lingo. And I moved there with my family as an expatriate. And it was an amazing experience. Three years that changed my mind. In my mind and my life. I heard in one of your podcasts that you interviewed a couple of people that have done ayahuasca. When I was in Brazil, that was the first time that that bug came into my consciousness ayahuasca because it's it comes from down there from the amazon and i started looking into it but i was a little afraid and things were actually going well at that point in my life so i figured you know maybe it's not it's not time for me to do it yet but i'll do it at some other time but that trip to brazil really changed the whole trajectory of life yeah. mm. accountants always fascinate me because if you ask <laughs> if you ask you know 99 percent of other people they'll say accountancy is probably their worst nightmare so what is it about accountancy that interested you or got you curious about it in the first place? Oh man, you're asking all the right questions. Another irony in my life, I'm realizing that there's a lot of ironies. So my mom and my dad were both accountants in uh, Guatemala. And in Guatemala, for you to graduate from high school, you must take, you must pass an accounting class. Maybe because they believe, the government believes that it's the language of business, who knows? Uh, but I failed that, that class. It was the worst class. Just like I was like 99.9% .9 of the people that just hate accounting. And I swore that I would never 
get an accounting degree. And I never, those, your two first questions are amazing because I never put two and two together that it, typically life takes me in a direction I don't want to go. And uh, so when I moved to the, to the States and I was going to Michigan State, um, I wanted to do and study international business. And I had to take a basic accounting 101 class and I did really well. And then the second account and kind of wanted to, I did extremely well. Uh, out of like a hundred students, I got like the second highest grade. So I figured it looks like I'm good at this. There's a market for it and I'm going to a good school. So might as well get that degree. And I got it, but I figure I'm going to do it for two, one, two years. And now I'm on year 24, still doing it. So um, it's been great. I believe my personality is uh, like yours, very curious. And I tend to take uh, big risks. So I think God was good to me and he just got me into a very conservative profession. So I would be more careful about life in general, about where I invest my money, how I do things. I mean, it, does, it didn't always work, but uh, that's how I ended up in, in accounting. Yeah. I'm definitely not a typical accounting. And now I see it as a, as a competitive advantage because most accountants are not people persons and they don't like to relate with the business and they are not in touch with what's going on there, the strategy and all that. But in my case, I like all those things. So I can bring that to the table and I develop trust in relationships with my partners, with the CEOs, the CEOs, and it, work, it works like a charm. So now I appreciate it. Uh, but, you know, I have other interests as well, such as the book and all those things. And my really my passion through this whole time has been traveling. I understand you like traveling as well. By the time I was 40, I had been to over 70 countries. And this job also allowed me to do that because as an auditor, I had to go to different different business units of different the companies that I worked for, worked for. So I worked for Motorola back early when Motorola was the Apple of the day. So I spent a couple of months in China, a couple of months in England, a couple of months in Dubai. And then from there, I would visit different countries where, where the weekend and with the PricewaterhouseCoopers, I did auditor audits in Latin America and Argentina, Mexico. So I was able to travel and then I worked for Royal Caribbean. So I went on a bunch of cruises auditing the cruise lines as well and visiting different islands. And it, it's been amazing. And with this current job, well, the, my, with the previous job that I had, when I went down to Brazil, I was the controller and the CFO for Latin America. So I visited multiple countries all the time. So I've been blessed with uh, being to a, a lot of places around the world. That has opened my mind a lot, maybe a little too much, um, because I wanted to try everything from every country that I ever went to. I don't know, I imagine you can relate to, to it. And I wanted to study there. Uh, economy, their um, religion, their culture, their politics, the magazine, The Economist used to be my Bible. I used to read The Economist cover to cover every week. Love they just wanted to know everything that was going on all over the world and watch different types of news just to be up to date in geopolitics and whatever happens everywhere. I stopped doing that uh, a couple of years ago, but that's been my passion. And that just really opened a lot of avenues for me to be curious, which is what I ultimately, my biggest quality, I think that's gotten me where I am. What are one or two places that you've been that surprised you the most? I'll, I'll use that, not your favorite, but just surprised you in what you were expecting going into it. And it was completely different than what you thought. Right, right, right. No, great question. Um, yeah, India and Thailand, both of those places really fascinated me uh, for different reasons. Thailand was more of a hedonistic uh, pleasure, just being at the beach. Have you been to Thailand? I have not, no. No. You Not yet. Go. Everyone should go before they die. You know, it's, back then when I went, uh, massages were like ten dollars. You can, I would just get like four massages a day at the beach. Beautiful beach, amazing. The food is just out of this world. I never realized. I never found a papaya salad here that tastes as good as in Thailand. And the people are outstanding. For some of the friendliest people I ever met. Beautiful, beautiful place. And then uh, India was more from the spiritual perspective. I went with my wife. We went for about two weeks. And uh, we back, back then we still hadn't done anything in the spiritual realm. We're still very much just living in the world of the flesh for lack of a better world, a word. And eventually she became a yoga instructor. I delved into meditation, yoga, a bunch of different things. But there we saw um, this whole spiritual side that we were very interested in, that, that really fascinated us. And, and everyone seemed to be at peace, very calm and very different than the, the Western world. And uh, there was something that really piqued my attention when I went. So two different... Two different countries in Asia, both one more from the spiritual side and one more from the from the flesh cardinal side. Yeah, both of those are high on my list. I haven't made it east of Europe yet. I was right. whenever I was deciding between either South America. Whenever I went to South America, I was deciding between either South America or Asia, and was going to do the you know kind of typical yeah. Southeast Asia tour, but landed on South America. So the Good. Asia 
Asia side is on the list and will be the next thing, next adventure at whatever point that's going to be. I'm not sure, but right. yeah, Thailand right. is uh, probably like my number one spot actually that is like on my list at this point. Awesome. It's great. You know, a quick analogy that I read 25 years ago about how to look at the world. If, if we think of the world as a city, you know, the US, Europe, Japan, Australia, the developed world are more like the suburbs. You know, they're safe, great schools, rich, kind of boring, right? Um, you see Asia, it's like the industrial part where things get made, people go and work in downtown, it's busy and everything else, right? Africa, the Middle East, they're kind of like neighborhoods that people are a little careful because it can get dangerous, you know? And Latin America, you know, Latin America is the South Beach, it's the fun where you go and have fun and just have a good time. And uh, in my experience, you know, I, I don't like to, to label things like that, but I, I think you've been to two good places. When you go to the, the Asia and everything else, you're going to see a total different side. But I think you started off really well. Latin America, Europe, the U.S. is good. It's good stuff. Then I wanted to do hop back to coming to the U.S. for college. What was that experience like? Right. Look, it was... Uh, Guatemala is a very poor country and I come from not only a poor country, but my family started off very poor. We grew up in, I grew up in one of the poorest neighborhoods in Guatemala. We had dirt floors growing up. So I never left the country. I never went outside of Guatemala ever. We needed a visa even to go to Mexico. So it was my very first trip abroad and everything was shocking to me. I wasn't prepared for anything for, I used to watch a lot of American TVs and I figure, oh, I know what the U.S. looks like. Oh, it's nothing like that at all. It's starting from the weather, especially going to Michigan in the, in the mm. winter. No, not fun. Yes, from Central America. But it was a college town, so it was it was safe. It was fun. It was cool. It was back then. I started. I went to school there. I went to Michigan State. My senior year, we won the national championship in basketball. We went to the Citrus Bowl, and we ended up ranked number like five. We went to the Frozen Four in hockey. So there was it, it was a lot of fun, and I had very good friends, and I got connected with all types of different people, and. It was a microcosm of what my life would become because uh, I really got, I used to hang out with a lot of the international students and, and I had a lot of American friends too. I lived with American friends and then Latin friends and it gave me even more hunger to go and explore the world. And, and even more, it got me curious, you know, between the U.S. and Guatemala, I, that's all I did for those four years in college. I went to Mexico for a little bit, but once I got out, after meeting all these people that would tell me all these things about all over the world, I just wanted to go visit their countries. And that, I just, I lived for traveling. I lived for wherever I, I could. I, my jobs were, I used to look for jobs with the intention of traveling as much as possible, getting as much as possible exposure to the world. And Michigan State was my first exposure to that. So I was very, very thankful. I'm very thankful that I ended up going there. And it's a great school. It got me great jobs. It allowed me to finance all these crazy things that I did through all these years. So I'm very thankful about that. I would love to hop into kind of the more spiritual side of things that uh, you mentioned a few times now. One, you talked about thinking about doing ayahuasca while you're in Brazil. Uh, right. You didn't do it, if I remember correctly. But then yes. India, the just spiritual nature of that place helped kind of gain that interest. So, And your book is called A Spiritual Seeker's Path to Freedom. Yes. So what did that path look like for you? Beautiful. I, I, you're a great interviewer, by the way. I'm loving it. Uh, way, way, way to connect the dots. Look, I grew up Catholic, a very traditional religion, going to Mass every Sunday, never missed Sunday Mass, did my first communion, all the, all the different sacraments. And I lived a conservative life up until I came here to the U.S. Um, there were some things that, were, uh, that I did that most American kids probably didn't do. I used to drink with my dad at, at home. He would give me a beer, do this, do that. And there's a, it's a little more liberal at, in the sexual side, at least in, in, in Guatemala than in the U.S. So when I came to Michigan State, there was a, a, a culture shock. But the one thing that happened when I came to Michigan State, which in retrospect, I wouldn't say it was negative because it got me to where I am today, but I completely abandoned my faith. I stopped going to church. I just lived a, a very hedonistic lifestyle. I worked hard. I studied harder. I partied harder. Uh, but there was no room for, for religion, spirituality, God, nothing like that. That completely stayed in Guatemala together with my family. I was here on my own. And you hear, as an, as an immigrant here, you hear a lot about the American dream. And I was definitely living my, Amer my American dream. My religion became self-help. I remember dating this girl that had this book called You Can Be Happy No Matter What. This is back in 1995. 
And I grabbed that book, I picked it up, and I started reading it. I'm like, oh, that was the most enlightening thing that I had ever read in my life. It was life-changing. I read it all once, twice, three times, and it kind of became my new Bible. I said, forget about the Bible. Then let me focus on how to improve myself, how to make it on my own, especially in the U.S., where, you know, it's different than where I'm from. That in Where I'm from, you can be very smart, have all kinds of degrees, be hard worker, but still don't get ahead for a variety of reasons. Here, it's for the most part, if you work hard, you see the results in my experience. And self-help was exactly what I needed at that point. It showed me how to, and I started reading every single self-help book that I could. I mean, I'm a voracious reader. So uh, from 1994 until 2014, for 20 years, I read and I read and I read sometimes one or two books per week about self-help and how to gain friends and influence people. Those are the first books that I was reading and the seven habits of highly affected people and uh, all that kind of books that were just, I was becoming this library of all the self-help things and just growing and growing and growing and growing and growing and growing, growing. And I saw the results and the results were fantastic. The results were fantastic. I, I was getting amazing grades. I grew up with almost a four point GPA in, from Michigan State in accounting, which is a relatively tough major. I got, I worked at one of the top consulting firms in the country, in the world, really. I got a, 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 a scholarship for the top accounting business school in, in the world. I ended up I did half of a master's degree in uh, positive psychology at University of Pennsylvania, which is the number one, they created positive psychology. It's the number one, is an Ivy League school, number one for that major. And I did uh, an executive degree in uh, business from Harvard Business School. So those things were working very well for me. And at work, as I mentioned earlier, I just kept getting promoted, promoted, promoted. So self-help became really my religion. That was my religion for all intents and purposes. And I had a ton of friends. Uh, I got married, but before that, I had a lot of girlfriends. You know, I did a, little, I did a lot of traveling. I did a lot of partying. And anyone that would see my life from the outside would say, "Man, that guy has the perfect life." I thought I had the perfect life. It really looked, it looked like everything I ever dreamed of and more. Uh, but there was always an emptiness, huge emptiness, and I couldn't put my finger on it. You know, and but I ignored it. I just stuck it under the carpet, and I kept doing my self-help, my self-improvement, my working on me, 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 and just accumulating all these things until I would say 20, 2014, I started asking deeper questions, right? Like uh, I imagine a lot of people that come to your podcast tell you similar stories. At least a couple that I listen to, they come to this point. You can call it midlife crisis or whatever you want to call it. I started asking questions, well, is, is this really worth it? Do I have my priorities straight? Do I really love my wife? Does she really love me? Do I love my kids? Why am I working so much? Visiting all these countries, was it worth doing all those things? Where am I now? What if I die tomorrow? Like what, what, why, why, who am I? All those things. What's my purpose? And I started a blog, a blog called In Search for Meaning. And I hadn't looked at it in a while. I looked at it, 472,000 people have seen it. I, you know, I posted a bunch of, I used to, I never monetized it. I just did it for fun. I just wanted to add value to people. I wanted to share my struggle with other seekers that we're looking for really meaning. Why are we here? And um, and that led me to Brazil. And my meteoric rise in my, with my company in uh, the corporate world finally stopped at one point when I was in Brazil. I actually hit a wall. You know, when I moved there as a finance guy, I barely spoke Portuguese. My, my, my first language is Spanish, second is English. Portuguese is, was a distant third back then. But I moved there and things seemed to be going better than ever. I was getting meetings with CEOs and CFOs for Fortune 100 companies to possibly become our clients and arranging pit pitches and CFOs don't do that in, in my industry. They're the number crunchers, you know, and I, we were doing really well, turning the business around and there was a lot of buzz around there. And I'm thinking, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Because back then my pride was so high, Nick, that I used to think that I could uh, manage any company of any industry of any size anywhere in the world. Really, I thought I could do that. No doubt, with all my preparation, my degrees, my experience, my self-help, my charm, my personality, you know, and it seemed to be working that way uh, until it didn't. So suddenly the CEO, the local CEO, and I develop a, a, a little rivalry. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's his fault or my fault. It's both of our faults. There was a lot of ego involved in, in that situation. And eventually, I mean, he was boss. He was my boss. And my, my indirect boss uh, sat in... Um, London, the worldwide CFO. And in a meeting that I had in London, he told me, Mario, the company, the CEO does, doesn't want you in uh, the office. And so just work from home. I was so hurt. 
So I work from home and that was a big hit for my ego. And that's when I, those questions that I had started asking started into high gear. And I, I heard someone in your podcast saying that they started using meditations, the app space. Uh, a good friend of mine that knew me told me, Mario, this is a good opportunity for you to start doing meditation. Your mind goes 100,000 miles an hour. You need to just chill and relax and take it easy. This is a perfect opportunity for you. In you know, 30 years, you haven't stopped. Take a break. You know, relax. Watch your thoughts. Do this. I thought, well, why not? I started doing the research and everything checked. Everything looked like that could be the, the solution for all my ailments, for anxiety, for fear, for depression, to get to know me better, uh, self-awareness, a bunch of different things, right? So I started doing Headspace. And uh, sure enough, I couldn't do 30 seconds when I started doing it. And then probably went from like a minute for like two weeks to five minutes in, in a month. And then I, went, I started increasing my time in meditation. And eventually I did a bunch of different meditation techniques from all over the world. I used to pay meditation retreats. I used to go on week-long meditations. I used to do four-hour meditations. I did, I, I done most of the meditations available in the world, I believe at this point, because I'm that kind of a nerd. And it helped me. It helped me a lot. It helped me to calm down, to ask the right questions. And even I started doing transcendental meditations. And someone that influenced me a lot was Michael Singer in his book, The Untethered Soul. And he's, he starts asking those very deep questions. He starts his book asking, who are you? And then most people say, well, I'm Mario. No, no, that's your name, but who are you? Oh, I'm an accountant. Oh, that's your profession, but who are you? And then he goes on and on and on and on until you get to the point where you say, well, I'm, I'm a consciousness. I'm, I'm the one watching the thoughts, right? So I went down that path for a few years. And again, it led me to a wall. I, I finally got to, there's this, um, this Vipassana retreat for meditators that's supposed to be the top of the top. I don't know if you ever heard about it or you interviewed anyone that has done it. But it's supposed to be, I don't know how many days of silent retreat and the, the top meditators in the world sometimes can't hack it. But what I heard, what I read that was interesting is that once you get to that point and you hit, you hit the wall, there's a point where, yeah, you're discovering a lot of things. You're getting a lot of answers, a lot of insights, a lot of self-awareness. But you get to a point where you can't go anywhere. It's like, oh, I got to the end. I'm stuck. There's nothing else for me. I never really got to that point because other things happen in my life. But I don't want to go too long and tell me if I'm, I'm going in the right track or you want me to, because there's a lot of layers to this journey, but tell me if you have any questions or any breaks that you want to, any, any insights or any uh, clarifications that you would like so far. Yeah, no, that's great. One just can relate very much. So in my own journey to, to that story, uh, if you look at the bookcase behind me, there are probably 60% of those are self-help books. And, you know, looking for, for answers and to your point, a lot of them are extremely beneficial. And so that's why I think a lot of people like us read 20, 30, 40, 50, hundred of them, right. but, but it's funny when you stop and think about it. And to be honest, the first time I've ever really thought about it was right now, whenever you were talking about your stories, like, well, if the answers were there, then you wouldn't need to read a hundred of the books. Right. You know, it's, <laughs> it's right. like the, the solution we're looking for isn't in those books or we wouldn't need to continue to read them. And yeah, of course there's stuff you can learn, but there is like this empty feeling that you still have, or again, you just would feel satisfied and not feel like you need to continue to search for the next answer, the next answer, right. the next answer. You got it. Um, yeah. And then the meditation part again as well. What, something that I started and something I still do every now and then what about it for you was that was so beneficial? You said it, you know, just helped you kind of right. cool down and yeah. ask some of the right questions, but right. you know, doing a four hour long meditation, that's pretty, pretty intense. <laughs> yes. I love it. Uh, yes. Look, and, no. and I, I've actually found some real answers. I'll tell you later on today in, in our interview, but you know, those four hour meditations, man, um, the anxiety slow down when I did self help. Actually, I have in my book, one of the things that has been revealed to me that I speak of when you read it, you'll remember this conversation is in the, from the biblical standpoint, you know, I always thought about spiritual spirit. I'm spiritual. I'm this, I'm this, but what is really the spirit? What does it mean? The Bible is actually very clear on what the spirit, the three components of a human being and the components are the body, which is what we physically see, the soul, which is kind of an intermediate between the spirit and the body. And the soul has our mind, our heart, and our will. And then most of what I was doing was from the soul and from the body. 
with my mind. I was trying to understand myself and the world and sometimes God or higher being with my mind. And my or minds are limited. I just couldn't. And now I understand. I quit trying to do that because I can't. And then the third part that the Bible tells us about is the spirit. And that involves communion with God, intuition, which is kind of the mind, the spiritual mind, and a conscience, which is what the sense of right and wrong. That's what the spirit, the spirit is of the human being from the biblical perspective. And now after many years, I realized that I wasn't really being spiritual. I was dealing with spiritual entities, but I wasn't being spiritual myself. I was being soulish. And the soul and the body, when they're together, they're the flesh. So I was very much of the flesh. So I wasn't going to get any answers, any real answers that way. By the way, a lot of those things got me where I am. And now all those things that I learned, I'm using them for a different point. And that makes all the difference. Why are you doing things? I'm not doing them for me anymore. I'll get to that in a minute. But so after I, so my, my what happens when I started with self-help, my mind was very active, super active. And my will very strong. My will is like, I'm going to do it no matter what. Grit, perseverance. Yes, I can, I can conquer the world. I'm going to move to the States. I'm going to go to an Ivy League school. I'm going to get the best job. I'm going to marry a beautiful woman. Will, 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 and mind. That's how I live my life. And a lot of those, a lot of us who are very driven and curious live our lives that way. Uh, but as self-help gets you there. But then you start asking those questions and then you get to something like, I actually have a graph in my book that's very telling about this journey that I took. Uh, I don't believe God used that journey in vain. Like he revealed that to me. Uh, the next step would be to do something like a meditation, either Eastern meditation or like a quantum meditation or a, a transcendental meditation or whichever. Med- I've done walking meditations, laying down meditations, all kinds of meditations. I went to, like, I want to say four or five uh, Joe Dispenza retreats where I learned all types of meditations. And, you know, I went to uh, Deepak Chopra's retreats. I learned a bunch of different types of meditations and all those meditations at the end of the day, they make your will kind of like go down a little bit. I don't want to say they make you lazy, but just a strong will as before. And your mind becomes passive, more passive than when you're in your self-help mode. So you're a little more passive, right? So I did that. Then right after I did that, I started looking at some mystical traditions that would put it all together. So I found a few things that, that at that time helped me a lot. They use meditation. They use a lot of different things from Eastern religions, and I call it New Age, really. And um, and so the very first one that I did was uh, a Course in Miracles that is supposed to be the Bible of the New Age. Have you heard about it? Are you familiar with it or not? No. No? Okay. So, well, you, you look into it, but hopefully after I talk to you about this, you're not going to want to do it. So it really what it does is it grabs all this. It's a thick, thick book. It's almost as big as the Bible, really. And he grabs all these elements from Buddhism, Hinduism, and quantum physics, and whatever other New Age things that are out there, shamanism, and different things, and puts it all together into one platform. And I studied that, and and it it asks you to meditate on it. And there's 365 lessons, one for each, each day of the year. I got to day 312. And man, very revealing. It, it shows you a different part of, um, of who you are and what people are. But so I did that. And that what the purpose of that or the result of that is that my mind became even more passive because I kept doing the things that the book told me to do. And my will became even lower, weaker, because I wasn't doing things by myself. I did a bunch of other things like a mystical school where you contact, you talk to angels and, and, and spiritual guides and enlightened masters. I don't know if you've come around this kind of language, but when I when I when I started doing those kind of meditations where I go up to my chakras and I get to my astral chakra, and then I was actually talking to these beings, and they would give me ideas. I would go every morning and tell them, "Hey, so I have this project from work. Tell me how to do it." And they would tell me the instructions. I would wake up from my meditation, write it down, and I would do it just like that. So as you can imagine, my mind was very passive. My will was almost like surrendered to this to these beings. Uh, so it was a down, downward situation that I was in. And then and then after that, I still wasn't getting the result, the answers I wanted. So I started talking to mediums, tarot readers. Uh, I did um, astral trips. I did all kinds of different things to get even more direct information. Astrology. I, w- I would get my astrological ca- chart done every year or more to get answers. Or I get my tar- tarot, read- my tarot card readings like every two weeks to find out like, what should I do here? What should I do? So my will was surrendered, you know? And in between that, I was doing plant medicine journeys. I started doing ayahuasca. I did mushrooms. 
I did a rape, I did a bunch of different things. Mushroom journeys, I did, I want to say like 12, 13. Ayahuasca, I only did once. But rape, which is a tobacco, a spiritual tobacco that you inhale, it gives you like, it's almost one of those things. All of these things, in, in my experience, help you to have like an ego death. So you can take a different perspective and that Michael Singer question of who am I? And you can look at it, you can look at your thoughts. It's that on steroids, right? So I kept doing that and getting all these answers from different things. But it wasn't the right answers. And what I noticed is that while my mind was passive and my will was surrender because of all these things that I did, my career started taking a dive. I was not doing very well. I lost one of my jobs. In the job that I had, uh, my, my boss told me that he wanted to terminate me, but he had mercy on me. He didn't terminate me. And with my wife, I almost get divorced. We, we had a lot of issues that were accumulating because I never gave her the proper priority. My priorities was, were either my wife or my career and sometimes partying. And, you know, depending on where the holes were, I would dedicate more time for my, my, career, my career or my wife or partying. But I didn't have a clear priorities. So I was having trouble at both of the, really, the pillars of my life, my marriage and my, my job. So I was, I started doing even more and more of these things, going deeper and deeper and deeper, deeper trying to get more questions. Meanwhile... My mind was more dormant. My will was surrendered. And at one point, I do believe that it was God who took me out of where we live. We used to live in Miami. Very, very fleshly, sinful life. We used to go clubbing, parties, my wife and I, and sometimes on our own end, and boat parties until 5, 6 in the morning. We'll get babysitters for our daughters, and they'll stay on their own Saturday, Sunday while we recover, hungover. I stopped going to church, and, and it was just mess. It was very, very, very messy. And at one point, I do believe that God just spoke to us with us knowing and just took us out of there. My wife got up one morning and told me, uh, hey, look, Miami's too expensive. You know, when can I stop working? And I said, you stop working. We can't live in Miami. So let's move to a smaller town. And it was in the middle of COVID. So we figured let's move to Cape Coral where we had a friend. We moved here thinking that it was for financial reasons. But really, we were just, God was taking us away from all that fleshly lifestyle. And when we moved here, I felt like a caged animal because it's a small town and I'm not used to this. I lived in Sao Paulo, a city of 20 million people, Chicago, 10 million people, uh, Miami, four or five million people. And here I didn't think I was going to be able to make it, but I started going to church. I found a totally different uh, way of being spiritual and that changed my life. So I'm going to pause here for you if you have any questions about that or you want to talk about the next level, but wow. Amazing. Did I throw Amazing a lot of you? <laughs> I just gave you a highlight, but you can ask about anything. <laughs> a little bit, uh, but no, it's all great. Obviously, everything has led you to where you are today, and so it all served its purpose in a way. Yes. Was there anything in particular that you really thought, like, this is the answer above kind of all the other things that you tried, and then you know, ultimately it wasn't, but right. throughout that right. journey... Where or what maybe one or two things that you're like, okay, this is what I was missing. I found it, but wait, oh, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it happened all the time. Uh, <laughs> and my wife could tell you like, how excited I used to get every time I found a new idol, I call him for lack of a better word, a new way of improving myself. I would come home excited. Look, I found this. I found this other thing. Nah, nah. This is it. I found it. This is this is going. It's going to get me there. What's going to get me there? Uh, I remember one of the ones that I was the most excited about was tapping. Have you heard about tapping? Like yep. you tap. Yeah, yeah. So I did a lot of tapping for a few months, and it worked. You know, I felt great, and you know, I was giving things up. I was surrendering, letting things, letting things go, and it was it was awesome, and it was working. I would tell everyone that I could, t I would talk to, hey, do do tapping, do tapping is great, and you. know, God gave me this gift of influencing people. You know, people trust me. So whenever I told people to do something, people, a lot of people would trust me and start doing it. So my friends and my family would start doing something like that. And tapping was one of those that later on, it was like cry wolf, right? I would tell them, no, 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 forget about tapping. You got to do this other thing. And then the other thing, they would be more skeptical and more skeptical, which is ironic because when I got to the next step of my, the, the final step of my spiritual search, um, now people are looking at me, even including my wife, Telling me, is this another one of those things, another one of those fads that you asked us, that you enrolled us, and at the end of the day, it wasn't it? And I said, no, 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 this is it. This is for real. I'm not going anywhere else. This is the end. But tapping was a big one. And doing plant medicine, I call them journeys. You know, I don't know what you call them when you heard the, the lingo that you hear out there. 
that was something that I I really enrolled as many people as possible. Right? With dozens and dozens of my friends and family, even family of mine. I had this great shaman that used to um, have these journeys that were just amazing. The journeys are, as I deepen into my spiritual uh, path, are probably the, the top predator of the spiritual world, in my opinion, because they mm-hmm. combine a little bit of everything. They combine all the fleshly things. All your five senses are immersed. They combine meditation. They combine they combine the, the smells, the music, yeah, what you're seeing, the things that you see, that you feel, that you experience. They take you to like different dimensions and all this kind of thing. So that to me was like, it, that took me a while to unwind from. And I used to enroll many people on that. And um, I used to think that was it. I used to think that's it. I'm, I'm just going to be doing journeys the rest of my life. And thankfully, I, I wasn't because I was addicted. The one thing that I was the most addicted to was rapping. Have you heard about rapping? You, you told me you yep. heard about rapping. Yeah. Yep. So I've done it myself. You done it? Okay, okay, okay. So when yeah. I did it, uh, my wife and I, I was doing it here. And then we went to Colombia for uh, her mom's from Colombia to, for a, a family trip. And someone offered us this rapid and said, this is really good stuff. Like, I just got it from the Amazon. And we did it. And I was like, whoa, what is this? That was amazing stuff. And after I did it, we ordered from this person in Colombia. And they used to bring us, like, like bulk of that stuff. And I had enough for a couple of years. And I, would, I wouldn't I would do anything without doing a rapid meditation. Like, I would go to work and go, like, if I got nervous or anxious, I would go to the parking lot. And do a rapid meditation and just chill there for 20, 30 minutes and go back to work. And I couldn't really function without doing rapid. And I would tell everyone, you should do rapid, you should do rapid, you should do rapid. And the, where I realized that that it was an addic- addiction for me was uh, my wife and my kid and my daughters and I went to Cancun to a five-star resort. One of the most amazing vacations that we've ever taken. So relaxing. We just did excursions during the day. All you can eat amazing food. Shows at night. And even then I brought my rapid with me and I would take a break from my relaxing vacation and do a rapid meditation. So I figured that hey, something is not right here. So that was difficult for me. I thought that was it. I thought tapping was it, but neither one was it at the end. Hmm. It's funny how something that can be beneficial for us yeah. can also, you know, turn and be a crutch at, right. at the same point. If we become reliant on it, then love, yes. but I'd love also to hear about your ayahuasca journey. It's something that, as you mentioned earlier, a bunch of people on the podcast have experienced and something that I've experienced as well. So just what was that like for you? Would you say, I guess, overall a positive experience or just reflecting again, reflecting back now on it? How do you view that right. experience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great. So look, I would say that doing a journey, it can go any way that the medicine will take you. It could be glorious. It could be healing. It, you, it could give you lots of abundance and it could give you, uh, it could condemn you. It can be, I had all types of journeys in my experience, very good ones that I, I would love, I would have loved to do again and some very bad ones that I never want to touch, touch again. For me, ayahuasca was a, a, not a very positive experience, not a pleasant experience at all. Even though I didn't perch, like most people, everyone that I've ever known that has done ayahuasca has perched. I didn't. And maybe that's part of the issue. But in all my other experiences doing journeys before that one, I had done I don't know, like 10 journeys before that one with other medicines. And and they were pretty, they, they put me in the middle of the universe and I was like moving stars or I was a lion and I was you know, my power animal and this and that. All beautiful experiences. But when I got to ayahuasca, the abuelita, the Grandma, right? That's that's what we call it in Spanish. She really kicked my butt <laughs> big time. She was just showing me all this, for a lack of a better word, but back then I would, I would say sinful things. Now I, I know they were sinful. This sinful things. She was showing me all these horrible things that I had done in the past. And she was telling me, if you keep doing these things, I'm going to come and kick your butt and I'm not going to be this nice. And that was not nice. I was, I had never been in that much fear in my life before. I, I felt like, cold i felt alone i felt uh it was it was really like a, a hellish experience and i remember when i got out of it the next day in an integration everyone was talking about their experience and i heard every, most of the people around me were purging and they were growling and it seemed like a, like they were having exorcisms and things like that and everyone was so happy and content and saying they couldn't wait to do it again and i told everyone i'm not doing that again you know i prefer to stay with mushrooms and other things so it was very convicting but 
in retrospect, and I never thought about this, so I'm glad that you asked this. It was the first time, it was like a warning for me that I had done wrong things in my life. Before that, I thought I had never done anything wrong. I thought everything is relative. No, it's all good. This world, like a lot of new age taught me, this world is an illusion. It doesn't matter what you do or you don't. I can't do anything wrong, so I can hurt you. And you can't do anything wrong to me, so you can hurt me. And and so I I never thought of, of me as an evil person, a sinful person. I, I thought of me and, and, you know, I told you that whole journey about my profession and everything else. People from the outside looking in thought I was a great guy. I used to volunteer. I used to help as many people as possible. I used to donate to good causes. So I thought I was good. But in reality, there was a lot of things that, that I was doing that were very sinful. And ayahuasca opened my eyes to that. And it was right before COVID. So then COVID hit. And then that's when things just came out in bunches. And, and then I really was looking for something to heal, but a true healing from all those things. So that was my mm. experience. Not the most, not, not the most glorious. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing it because most experiences that people hear on the internet nowadays are how amazing it is to your point of just the people with in your own experience that just, right. it might not be the prettiest thing during it, but like afterwards it's like this overall great experience. And in my experience, it was a very positive experience for me. It was, it was, yeah, how was it? Tell me, tell me. Yeah. So for me, honestly, it was like the first time that I actually felt God in my life. And how do I want to put this? Actually, to be like in the idea of what you talk about is just love, unconditional love, something that that is something that I've always mm. struggled with in my life, accepting love, feeling love for myself. And that was the first experience that was just like just over abundance of love. And I was able That's to good. forgive myself for my own sinful past and things I've done right. and the people I, people I did wrong. And so just pathway of getting to where we're at, I wouldn't be where, where I'm at in, in my own journey and way I view things as well without it. Similar to you, I thought that was the end all be all. Like I just go to ayahuasca once a year and you know all my problems are solved and just like it is what it is but as i've continued on the path that was in when did i do that december of 2021 is whenever mm. i did my journey um and i don't know if they said it for you but they what i heard whenever i was down there is ayahuasca gives you what you need not what you want you know everybody goes right. down there with this goal of i hope to get this out of the experience and to be honest, I didn't really have a, a goal per se, but that's what I got and what I brought back with me. And it's been super beneficial. And what I've come to realize and come to understand is like, I thought I needed that, or I thought I needed right. mushrooms, or I thought I needed something to right. be able to ex have that experience where right. that experience of just unconditional love is always there for you. If you are willing, if you are accepting of it. Um, and if you're able to accept it in your own life, again, that's just like, was always my biggest struggle. Just like mm. saying I'm able to accept love for myself or for other people. And so touching on that idea of just love, what is the answer that where you are now has given you that the other experiences haven't? Beautiful. And I love that you talked about love and unconditional love. That's, that's awesome. I had the motto of during those journey days, uh, love is always the answer. And uh, I was reading a lot of Matt Ken. I don't know if you read this guy, Matt Ken. But he's all about love mm -hmm. and all that. And you know, he was very influential in my life at that point. And by the way, I think all, everything that's happened to me, I love it because otherwise I wouldn't be able to talk to you right now or talk about this or you know, give my testimony to other people. So yes, love became an obsession to me. It was all about love, love, love. And that's all I wrote about in my blog and every, everywhere else. But I realized I didn't really know uh, true love in the way that now I understand it. The Bible talks about four different types of love. There's the Eros love, the, the love between a man and a woman, romantic love, love with the family. And there's the one with your friends. I forgot the exact Greek term. And then there's finally agape love, which is unconditional love, the one that I believe you're referring to. And that unconditional love, I had, I thought I had experienced it, but I really hadn't until I discovered the true Jesus Christ. 
that's when everything came together for me. And by the way, I'm not saying that I'm even remotely, I, I already know all of Jesus. It's a journey and it's really an eternal journey. It's a journey that for us believers, that we who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we get to know a little bit here, just the tip of the iceberg, and then we're going to spend eternity with him. And when we do that, we're going to be every single day, every hour, every minute, we're just going to be in awe of all the things that, of his love for us. And and it's I'm looking forward to eternity, getting to know that true, pure love that he is. He is love. That's why he's God is love, the true God, which leads me to when I got here, to Cape Christian, really looking for love, Cape Coral and the church or churches called Cape Christian. And I was resistant still, resistant to, to go back to church and just, you know, I went, I went to church as a checklist, just like, oh yeah, yeah, let's, my wife is going to church. My kids are going to church. I'll go to church too. And on Thursday nights, there was a Bible study group for women and one for men. And there was childcare. And since the first Sunday that I was here, I started going to church and I loved it. I loved the message. It made me feel good, but I still was doing all the other stuff on the side, right? The very first time that my wife on a Thursday night went to a, a Bible study, she told me, hey, do you want to come with us? I said, no, 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 I'll stay with the girls. We'll hang out. And she told me, no, 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 they're coming with me. There's childcare. So you're going to stay by yourself. So I was forced to go to church. So I went to church and I'm there walking in thinking, oh, this is, this is a Christian church. It's a small town. Like, what am I going to talk to these guys about? Like, I have nothing in common with these guys. I'm a big time sinner. Like, what? Like, like I, I've done drugs. I do drugs. I've had so much sex more than like, they care to know or know. And like, I've done all these crazy things and party and I get drunk. I get wasted. Like, why do I do these things that they would consider satanic? So why am I going to go there? Right. So I go there and I sit down and I'm just observing and, you know, we get a message and then we're around a table, table discussion, which is a typical format for this type of things. And I'm typically the first one to speak, but there I thought, well, I was a little ashamed. So I'm thinking, I'm going to wait to see what everyone has to say. And then I hear the first guy saying, yeah, I was an alcoholic. I became homeless. I lost my family. I lost everything. But then I found Jesus. And now he restored my life. I haven't drank in 20 years. I get married again. I redeemed my life. I'm like, whoa, that's drastic. That's dramatic. The next guy, well, I'm a vet from Afghanistan and Iraq and I killed, I don't know how many people, a bunch of my friends died in my arms and I had PTSD and I was lost and I found Jesus and, and now I serve here and I'm happy and I'm like, whoa, what's going on? Then this other guy, well, you know, I was in jail because I did these horrible crimes and I'm like, wow, that's hardcore. I never done anything like that. I never been to prison and I found Jesus inside the prison and he changed my life and now I got out, I got out earlier and now I do this. I work for a non-for-profit. I help kids. I'm like, what is going on? So maybe my issues are not as, as big. Maybe this God is, is good enough to forgive me. Maybe he can give me that love that I'm looking for. And then I started giving my testimony and all these guys were so accepting. No one judged me. They accepted me and I felt at ease. So I started going to that church and little by little, you know, a couple of months, I met Pastor Corey. He asked me, so what season of your life are you in? That's Christian for what's going on in your life, the season, right? I, no one ever, ever asked me that. And I started telling him, telling him I do all these things. Drrr, all the things that I've been talking to you about. And he didn't judge me. He just looked at me and he saw the potential. And he's, he told me, oh, great. We can use someone like that here. I talked to this, talked to that. I'm like, really? Like, you don't think I'm crazy? Like, no. And I'm pretty sure out of like 4,000 people that go to that church, maybe there's one or two people that have done all the stuff that I have done. But no one cared. No one judged me. So I'm like, okay, fine. I started, I started serving, doing this, doing that. I served. I led a small business group based on Bible principles. And I met a, a, a lot of amazing people and I was, things were going great. And, but I wasn't reading the Bible. And on a trip to Disney, my wife tells me on the way there, by the way, I want you to know that I want to raise our daughters based on the Bible. And something in me was like, ah, no way, man. I, that's a little too much. I can't do that. I, I, there's no way. That's an antiquated book. It's irrelevant today. There's a lot of things because I had studied the Bible or so I thought. There's a lot of things there that I disagree with. Now, we cannot do that. Are you crazy? No way. There's no way. There's no way. And we had an argument for like two hours on the way there. We stopped at the gates of Disney. Ironic, right? Because a lot of Christians have issues with Disney. And I said, no, 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 no. And we left it at that. That week, two different people that I respect a lot, one of them, a millionaire, an entrepreneur, Christian, stopped his sermon in the middle of talking. And he says, I feel like I, someone needs to hear this message. This book, he grabbed the Bible, the Bible, Bible one. This is the only book that you need. You don't need anything else. You don't need to read anything else. To me, it was a shock. Like, what? But I read like 500 books. What are you talking about? So I was very convicted. 
Then someone else says the same thing in, in, in another group that I went to. Yes, you only need the Bible. Don't worry about anything. Who needs an importation? I said, me, I need an importation. And this guy, this guy goes, I impart on you guys that the word of God. And he goes, going on and on and on. I'm like, wow. I came home and I told my wife, okay, I surrender. Let's read the Bible. So I started reading the Bible in a, from a different perspective. I opened it. It was speaking to me in my spirit, not in my mind, but in the spirit, not in the soul, but in the spirit. And I started looking at it from a different perspective. And I'm thinking, boy, this is the real God. This is the real spirit, the Holy Spirit. Everything else I was looking at before, it was just a shadow, a foreshadow of all this. It was preparing me for this or either that or it was false. I'm not going to judge it. I'm just going to focus on this right now. And I started my deep, deep, deep relationship with God at that point. I surrendered. I got baptized. I got baptized when I was Catholic, but I got baptized again as an adult. I surrendered my life to Jesus. I said, I give, uh, I, I make, I repent from my sins and I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. My life is yours. Do whatever you want with it. And ever since then, he's been healing every part of my body, every part of my, my mind, every time my, my heart, every part of my spirit. And now I see the true, true way to eternal life, to all the things that I was looking for. He became like the four big issues that I had is, who am I? Now I know I'm a child of God because I accepted Jesus. What's my purpose in life? My purpose in life is to be more like Jesus every day, to help others, to be the light of the world like Jesus is, to speak about what Jesus has done in my life. Then my provider, I was nervous about losing my job and that caused anxiety. And now I know that God provides. No matter what I do, I can do no wrong. He loves me unconditionally. He's always going to be providing for me. And number one, I was a people pleaser and I have true acceptance in him. Now I know that he loves me no matter what. He loves me. God loves me so much that he sent his only begotten son so that he died for me. So I have, I can experience this life and I'm experiencing, I'm walking in it every day, something I never experienced before. And it's amazing. I want to tell everyone about it. I want everyone to know that this is the only way, truth in life. Everything else, man, watch out. Anyway, I want to take a, a, a break here for you to ask any questions because I know we're we're, uh, we're running out of time. What do you think about your Catholic upbringing? Did it have any impact on the beliefs that you had about God, about Jesus coming back around? But then also whenever you were going through all your self-help books and everything else that you've done, why was religion kind of the the last thing again something i relate to very much where i grew up catholic as well did all the sacraments right. so on and so forth and right. again i was doing the same thing i was looking everywhere but religion i was right. trying to avoid it for whatever reason that i'm still you know kind of parsing through but for you what was it about just kind of that upbringing and did it have yeah. any impact on why you chose all those things that you chose before? Yes, no doubt, no doubt. I'm glad, man, you, this conversation has been guided by the Holy Spirit. I hope that you see it because it's been, it's been so God ordained. If you might, you don't mind, I'd like to read a page from my book. You get a reading. Please, from, please. Right? I after, I, I, in, after I complete speaking about all these different types of new age modalities, idols that I experienced, right before I started talking about Jesus, I say anything but Jesus. And let me preface it by saying that my Catholic upbringing was a lot about religion, true religion, the, the religion that people despise. They want to say, oh, you're just judging everyone. You're just saying everyone's going to go to hell. You're just all these rituals and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. My religion was like that. I really knew of Jesus, but I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. Now I have a relationship with Jesus, and that made all the difference. Before, I was driven by fear, not by love. I was very fear that I could end up in hell if I didn't do certain things. I could end up in purgatory if I committed a sin and I didn't confess. So I thought at one point, I thought, oh, that's all garbage. I don't care about that stuff. I'm just going to live my life, right? Like, who cares about that? Like, I, like who cares if there's even a heaven or an earth? I know I'm going to keep doing my thing. And then that definitely had a, an impact on, 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 the, on the rest of my journey. But I want to read this to you at the end of, of the paragraph preceding my relationship with Jesus. I say, anything but Jesus. As you read this book, you may have wondered at certain points why I was so gullible and simply accepted at face value whatever all these New Age idols told me, especially for a skeptical auditor by trade who is supposed to question whatever is thrown my way. It is surprising that I would try all these different things without questioning. I wondered that myself many times. I was a spiritual seeker that wanted to find happiness no matter what. Every time I found something new that promised enlightenment, I pursued it. 
I started from the assumption that whatever I would explore next was beneficial. I find that optimistic, exploratory, can-do attitude in most people that decide to journey into new age. That is, until someone brings up Jesus and the Bible. Even though I grew up with the Bible and in church, I did not believe in it. I reacted so dismissive if anyone that would bring up the Bible, to anyone that would bring up the Bible. I wonder why they believed in a bunch of fables and antiquated ideas that did not apply to the modern world. I had respect for Jesus, but did not see how he could provide the thrills and assurances that all my new age practices were providing me. I am convinced that the devil had me controlled and blinded, and I would accept anything he presented to me except the real Jesus. And I believe the devil has blinded most people's minds, most people's minds, so that they cannot see the glory of Jesus. That is why spiritual seekers accept yoga, meditation, tarot, tarot readers, chakra healers, and any other fad without questioning. But the minute someone says Jesus, we run for the hills. The devil is a liar and the father of all lies. Do not listen to him. Let us now explore together the only thing that can fill that hole in our soul, Jesus. Yeah. So there's something, I've discussed this with several people who have gotten out of New Age, that we just, oh yeah, 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 what? journey, I'll do a journey. Wait, 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 you you go do tapping, I do tapping. Oh wait, let's go to Amazon. We say yes to everything. I never said no, I never questioned anything. I just want to do it, do it, do it. But the minute my wife said, let's read the Bible, I'm like, no, that is crazy. I cannot possibly read the Bible. And it probably had to do with my upbringing. You know, she didn't grow up in the uh, strict Catholic environment that I grew up in. So she was more open to explore it. But I was a little scarred. And I, I have a little bit of a piece in my book about people who have been scarred by religion and how to get over it. But, you know, uh, that's a topic for a different uh, conversation probably. Like you said, something I relate to very much, but it is funny that, because I was the same way, like, anytime you bring up Jesus, uh, no, 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 that's crazy. Not me. <laughs> but yeah, to your point of whatever it is, psychedelics, meditation, just anything off the off the wall that is different because you're able to convince yourself that like, oh, this is new. So new has to be better, right? Like right, somebody right, right. has taken time to think through this. And like, if they're presenting a new idea and people are interested and following, that's means it has to be doing something and being helpful. But right. when you think about it, that's, you know, completely kind of backwards. It's like, if someone, something's been around for 2000 years that's probably the thing that is most beneficial right if it if it did if it wasn't beneficial then it would just have evaporated over time right yeah no, look, I, look I, i'll tell you something that was very revealing to me as uh, someone that has traveled to a bunch of places as we spoke at the beginning is that everywhere i went people have i never heard anyone speaking negatively of jesus even in india china where it's restricted or in latin america I never heard anyone that said, no, Jesus is crazy. Dude. Like, what are you doing listening to Jesus? Even people in New Age, even shamans, even uh, Santeros. Santeros is like a Latin you know, witch. Like, I actually talk to those people as well. They will not mess with Jesus. No, no, Jesus is Jesus. Jesus is who? It's Jesus and everyone. Else. Even people who claim that Jesus is just another enlightened master, they put him, put him on top of everyone else, on top of Buddha and Krishna. And they're like, no, Jesus is Jesus, right? An ascended master. But then... Here comes the interesting part that got me. For someone that's an analytical, like I believe you are, then have you read what Jesus said about himself? Jesus, in his word, in the Bible, he says, I am the only son of God. I am the only way, the truth, and the life. I, The Father and I am are one. I am God. If you don't come to me, you go to hell. So is he a liar? Is he crazy? So he can't be both. He can be enlightened and he can Did he ever speak a lie? No. Most people agree, no. Some people disagree if he's sin or not. He never sinned. So if you take him at his word, then you you get into a spot, into a corner where you're thinking, okay, so now what? So if this guy is he, who he says he is, who am I? And who is he? And like, what about all these other things? So yes, he became to me, when I think of truth, I think of Jesus. Now, all the other things that I did, they have a pinch of truth. Actually, sometimes a lot of truth. They could have half truth. Or like I mean, something, a book, I, thought, I don't know if I have it there, a book that I read that was life-changing to me was about levels of power from the 70s. Uh, I don't have time to look for it, but this guy, I forgot his name, in the 70s, he did great research measuring energy levels of different things. I don't know if this, you read uh, this guy. David Hawkins? Uh, yes. Thank you, David. Power, I think, or something like that. Yes. You the man, Nick. So if you go back and look at that table of energy, he has Jesus up there. Like he's the one that's holding the whole thing together. So even people who 
are not Christians. Acknowledge that, you know? And when you think about those things, it really makes you wonder, like, what is it about Jesus? Come and see. He tells us, follow me. Come and see. Come check it out. Read the Bible. See if it speaks to you. See if he's telling you some things. Because the devil, and I don't know, let, let me ask you this. Do you believe in the devil? It's okay if you don't, you know? I do. Uh, I do. Not previously, but I do at this point, yes. Okay, good, good. I'm glad. This, By the way, this podcast is so blessed. Whoever listens to this, is, is an, it's, an, it's an amazing message that the Holy Spirit is giving to, through you and me. So the devil is the, the father of all lies. He's a liar from the beginning, right? So he uses the word of God, the truth, and then he gives you 90%, 50%, 90%, 99%, and then he twists some things. And that's the way well, he did it with Adam and Eve. Did God really say that? Right. And in New Age, he the same thing. He gives you a lot of beautiful things and unconditional love and joy and peace, but not the real deal at the end of the day. And um, what I'm looking for before, and now I realize that before I was looking at, because God created everything. God created the devil. The devil is a created being too. And and the God uses even the devil. He used the devil in my case to get to him and to get to, to a lot of people who never heard of Jesus maybe. And what I was looking for before are the footprints of God as his creation evolves. When I studied the quantum and different dimensions. God created all that. So you can adore the universe, adore a plant, adore Pachamama, Mother Earth, the devil himself, but why not worship the one that created them all, which is God? You don't have to settle for his creation. You can go and have a direct relationship with him. Beautifully put. Mario, I really appreciate you coming on. My final question that I ask everybody, and you've touched on it a little bit, but what is your why? Why do you do what you do? <laughs> I love it. My why, yeah, that, that's easy. I had a blog called Search for Meaning. That's what I was searching for. What's my why for years and years and years? But now it's very clear to me. My why is to simply give glory to God. And what does that mean? That means people can see me and say, wait, that guy came from there. He did all those things and God changed him that much? That must be a powerful God. I'm going to check him out. That's giving God the glory. I hear athletes, there's this current on, on from my homes to a bunch of people, NFL, NBA players that are Christians, and they keep saying, and they, if you look them up, they say, oh, I'm doing everything to give God glory, to give God glory, to give God glory. I, you know, I was baffled by that. Why are they saying all those things? Well, when when I'm right now, this conversation you and I are having is giving God glory. It's beautiful. And that's what I live for. Through my book, through my actions, I work with my family. When I go to church, when I talk to someone, I don't want to condemn anyone. I don't want to tell them you're going to go to hell, stop doing that. I just tell them, look, this is my testimony. You may not believe the Bible, but you can believe me because this is my experience. You, look, you can see it's tangible. And, and what I'm doing is I'm giving God glory. So that's my why. Love it. And I actually want to add on one more question now that just about the book. Why now? Why not write it 10 years from now? Why not write it two years ago? What about right now that you felt the need to write it when you did? Oh, Nick, man, it's going to sound like we planted that. I planted these questions. <laughs> Those are amazing questions. Uh, well, one of the things that makes the Bible so real and it's, it's, it's living proof. You know, if you look at all the other religions and with all due respect, I studied many of them. They're someone's ideas and they, they don't let, lend themselves to evidence and, and to proof. Like every single person that I know that tried to disprove the Bible has become a Christian from C.S. Lewis. So there's plenty of document, documentation from people who have tried and they just fail miserably and they come to the conclusion that Jesus did exist. He did die. He did resurrect. The Bible, everything the Bible says has been proven. Every time someone says, no, Pontius Pilate didn't exist. Then sure enough, something about Pontius Pilate pops up from history. Yeah, here it is. He existed. One of the things that makes it amazing is prophecy. And there's about a third of the Bible is prophecy. And I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess that 90% of that prophecy has already come true. Like it's, it's already happened. Jesus fulfilled most of it from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is really a prophecy about who Jesus was going to be. The New Testament, the God four Gospels are Jesus revealed. And the rest of the New Testament is Jesus explained. So it's all about Jesus. The Bible is all about Jesus, nothing else. Um, so when I look at the prophecies that are yet to be, to come tr true, are the, the ones that are about the end times. And one of the big, when the clock, the prophecy clock started ticking is when Israel was formed in May of 1948. In a day, the, the, U, the UN just approved them, gave them a country, say, here it is. That's when everyone around the world that knows the Bible and prophecy say, wait a minute, what's happening? 
this is we're in the last generation. That's what Jesus tells us in his word, that once all the children of Israel, of the Jewish can come back to their land, that's the last generation. So this is it. And now if you look at the eclipse, the war in Israel, like everything that we're seeing in our culture, the godlessness and the power of God also at the same time being very strong. It's a recipe for the last days. And right now people are becoming more open to either go to Jesus or go to the other side. And, and Jesus had, has given me this book to do it now because we're running out of time. No one knows. Even when people ask Jesus, when, it, when is the end days? When is this going to happen? He said, even I don't know. Only the Father knows. Only God knows. He's God, but in his human form, he couldn't tell us. I don't know when that is. Anyone who tells you it's tomorrow, it's next year, is, is lying because no one knows. But for sure, we're getting closer, closer than yesterday. And it's urgent. I want to take this book to as many people as needed. So that's why. I love it. And if people want to check out the book, where's the best place for them to purchase it? Yeah, Amazon, Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com as well. Those are the distribution channels I'm using. People have asked me to translate it into Spanish, Portuguese, have it in audiobook. I'm working on that. Right now you can get it in Kindle or you can order it physically as well. So thank you for that, Nick. I appreciate it. Awesome. And if people want to connect with you, are you on social media at all? Where's the best place for them to find you? I am. I am. I reactivated my Twitter account because of you. So you can, uh, people can reach me there. I don't know if you can put it somewhere it. in your blog, I, Twitter and Instagram. Awesome. Yeah. I'll have all that linked in the show notes for your social accounts and then also Amazon, Barnes and Noble and stuff like that. So people can easily find you and find the book. Awesome. I appreciate that, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. It's all for Absolutely. God. So thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. And Mario, again, this was amazing conversation. I love, again, the serendipitous chance of it all coming together and the fact that we're sitting here together. No coincidence in my book. And so thank you for your time. And I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Nick. You did an amazing job. I'm going to listen to more of your podcast. It's awesome. Thank you. Have a good one. God bless you.